Okay, hello and welcome back. This is lecture two of the Java EE course, and today we're going to finish lecture one. Uh, so it's lecture two, but it's like finishing of lecture one. We stopped at enterprise networking and the concept of the uh, network architectures on slide number 33. So I'm going to go to slide 33 and pick up where I left off from last week. And uh, let's see, what were we talking about? I think we stopped, well, actually this is a really good one to start on, I guess, the enterprise. <clears throat> In terms of what this is, and this is the theme for today, and then uh, I believe I'm going to get into more UDP and TCP and networking and IP type of information before I hit JDBC. Uh, so JDBC is not going to be the next lecture, as I said last week. I'm going to push it off for another week, only because I need to install my software, otherwise I can't show you anything. Um, I mean, I was having a little problem with disk space on my computer, so I have to make some room to install. So once I get my database installed, we'll do the D JDBC. And uh, <clears throat> I will save the links and probably do a tutorial video on installing Oracle or MySQL on a MacBook and on a Windows system as well. Mm -hmm. So you can go ahead and put that in, in on, on your system and install your system as well. So anyway, we stopped at the concept of the enterprise. And the enterprise being the uh, entire, this is why it's called Enterprise Edition. We're looking at the networking components and building a framework in terms of connecting applications with databases, which is why we're looking at JDBC, uh, with application servers, web servers, and all sorts of different components as they fit into this. What well, looks like a puzzle in terms of this picture, where we have customers and partners and suppliers and all sorts of different people, and here's some of the employees out here, working with the systems. The systems are all hopefully sharing data across them each one of the systems and hopefully the systems are communicating with each other so we have the customer service system hopefully communicating with the inventory management system and the sales systems and everything and this is really the definition of what we're meaning by the term enterprise so the Java enterprise application development environment builds applications for the enterprise not for a single standalone computer which is really the big differences between the standard JDK and the EE version of the software package or APIs. So the framework is the classification. It's the scheme for, for the scheme for classifying and organizing the topics related to managing the enterprise. And I hit the slide last time. This is where I pretty much ended, showing the enterprise architecture, considering the design, the operations of an organization, and many of the different aspects, components, and disciplines. And this concept of the distributed system architecture is, I believe, where I left off. Uh, so I'm gonna, this is the starting point for today's new information. So we're looking at what's called an architectural model. If you take a software engineering course, the first thing you do when you start building the analysis and design of your new software system is to consider the architecture. And the architecture in terms of software development has to do with the application that's being built and how the software modules or components, classes or objects are working with each other, how they're interacting, the messages that they're sending back and forth. So if you apply the same concept to a system and to a network, what you're looking at is how the same pieces but applied towards a networking architecture instead of a software architecture. So in terms of the architectural model, what is it? It defines <clears throat> the way in which the components and the systems interact with each other. That's a really nice definition in terms of what an architectural model actually is. And also the way the components are mapped in onto their underlying network or their computers it's the glue that's holding them together is sometimes the reference. So as an example, if I were to say we're building a, a network on a middleware platform using RMI, remote method invocation, which is what we're going to be doing later in the course actually, <clears throat> then RMI would be the architectural model in that particular case. It would be, we, we would be referring to the middleware platform that's holding all those pieces together in terms of their connectivity. So we can decompose the model the architecture of the distributed system with vertical and horizontal tiers. So the tiering concept in the end tier, which I sort of introduced last week, <clears throat> is the way that we describe the architectural model. You want to think of it that way. This is more than just the vocabulary. This is actually the underlying concept of this architecture that we're looking at in terms of what makes it distributed, what makes it client-server and what makes it, um, you know, the internet networking or intra versus inter and all of the other different components that are associated with the terminology. 
Well, every single operating system out there on the market today is following a layering approach. It's really hard to get even your iPhone applications. Your iPhones, your Android phones, your Blackberries, your Blueberries, your whatever you have is layered. Even your, even your desktop operating systems, even your tablet computers are running on a layered architecture. Your tablets have an Android, if they're running on an Android platform, they have an Android kernel, they're, they're running on a Linux system. <clears throat> and they have, there's a kernel under there and there's a framework on top of that and then a framework on top of that. So the layering as an example, this is pretty typical for your devices, for platform devices. So your devices, you know, obviously your phones, your computers, your... And have you yet to seen a layered television set yet? I'm waiting for that. <laughs> but that seems to be the next generation, especially now that we have TV broadcast over internet IP. And, um, you know, that kind of there's a blurry distinction now between cable providers and content providers in terms of what's going on, in terms of how we're delivering the information to the consumer. But I can imagine in the future some sort of a layered architecture on a television set that's also a computer, that's also a this, also a that. So convergence, I guess, is the term I'm looking for in that particular example. <clears throat> but the, on the top, we always see the application layer. We have to see the operating system layer, then the hardware layer underneath, which is the classic, you know, you take operating systems 101 as an undergraduate student, and you learn this. This is what the operating system is all about. So in here, I'm putting it into an example, Internet Explorer as the application running on Windows XP or Windows 7 on a Pentium. Dell Experian Pentium would be the equivalent to that. And most people are familiar with that because you use it every day. That's what you are hopefully using every day as computer science students. <laughs> so <clears throat> if we take a look at the Internet as an example, the tiering is slightly different. And this is where people aren't normally, it's not really trans, it's kind of transparent. It's not really obvious to the user sometimes how the tiering is actually set up. And this is a basic tiering. And this is the traditional model that for which we're actually kind of deviating a little bit from these days. Um, the tiering in a three tier would be a client, a web server, and some sort of persistence that might go on. And this would be persistence in terms of states, sessions, behaviors, activities, transactions, all sorts of different things that happen in this particular layer that create the transparency for you. That, and then what I mean by transparency is that you can't see the layers, that they're all clear, you know, it's all mixed together. And you, there's no distinction between the different layers. In the old days, there was a distinction. In fact, you can remember this really easily if you think about dial-up modems. You were either connected to the internet or you were unconnected <laughs> and you physically hooked up your phone line and you dialed through a modem. Um, and for those of you who have not experienced this, made a bunch of noise and you know you got a connection. Well, 56K is, I believe, the only thing we got out of that. <clears throat> now people and consumers don't know if they're connected or not, really. And they're connected 24 hours a day. That's actually kind of the Web 2.0 concept. If I talk about the generations of the internet in terms of our tiering, 1.0 was not transparent. It was dial-up. It was you were connected or you weren't connected, and you knew it. The consumer knew it 100%. 2.0, we don't really know. 2.0, the connection is blurred. We have transparency, and we have applications, as an example, that are running on our desktop that are going out to the internet and getting information for us and are populating. As an example, uh, we've seen 2.0 <coughs> web terminology with Windows 7, with widgets that sit on the desktop. And one of the widgets, for example, goes out and checks the weather. We look at our computer and we go, oh, it's a 68 degrees today. Oh, nice. But we don't know that that came from the internet. Uh, but we have a constant connection now. So 2.0 enabled web intelligence. We also have programs that update themselves. You know, it would be nice for them to tell us that they're doing that. In fact, Windows does that all the time. You know, hey, but actually Firefox, if you haven't noticed, it does it in the background. It'll occasionally tell you to reboot, or not reboot, but restart your browser. It's because it's going to apply a new update. And a lot of other programs can be configured that way as well. But that's really what's referred to as the 2.0 technology. And then we have 3.0, which is uh, here. Not very common in desktop applications, but that's when... We don't know the difference between the internet and reality. It's more the virtual reality, where we have virtual walkthroughs, virtual live video feeds. Um, the ex presence and existence of the internet in our real world and us in the internet 
with tran no tra with with transparency, not knowing the difference between it being in the internet application or it being the real world. That's kind of scary when you think about it. Um, most people can handle 2.0 because the internet just follows them. It's like the Verizon network; it just follows you around. You know, it's with you every day. Everything you have, all your appliances, everything is all connected to the internet constantly. That's nice, but when you start losing the distinction between is it on the internet or is it here? That's the weird part. We'll see that with desktop applications when we get thin clients, when we get when we go back to dumb, thin, useless little clients that are constantly connected to the internet, but your applications and everything is on the internet. So your client can be thin because all you need is a screen and a keyboard, really, and an internet connection. <laughs> Everything is somewhere else. And we see 3.0 with cloud computing, actually, because the cloud follows us. And we're using kind of, we're watching TV shows, if you have Comcast Cloud Network or something, as an example. Uh, but you don't have that. It's, you're on the Internet. <sighs> Your experience in life on the Internet instead of life in life, seriously. So. But we'll see that uh, <clears throat> as the futuristic applications come out in the future, Web 3.0 is definitely uh, going to be on the horizon. And it'll change the computing environment as well. Uh, but going back to the concept of the Internet in terms of its tiering, each tier consists of one or more components and collectively fulfill a common purpose in terms of the structural tier. An example, the client tier is our Internet application. Our applications are, would be our client tier. And our web tier would be our Apache server or something of that nature. And then the Oracle database would be, let's say, the persistent tier, meaning that <clears throat> it's going to save information for us. It's going to house up information and give us things when we need it um, in terms of keeping persistent data across the, uh, across the line. And the persistent data, this is actually what gives us more of the 2.0 kind of interface. When we have email messages that are on a server, but they're also on our clients, and we can go to different clients, and we have the same messages, same red ones, same unread ones, and we have the same photos and the same everything everywhere we go, regardless of which device we're on. That's kind of the best part of the persistent tier in terms of the transformation on 3.0 as that's coming out. And that's really more of a 3.0 kind of concept. So, Have you guys heard of the 1.0, 2.0, 3.0? It's kind of a jargon speak in a lot of ways in the media, in the U.S. at least, because people like to put labels on stuff. They're not happy with just the Internet. <laughs> so now they have to have 2.0, 3.0. And pretty soon, I mean, there probably is a 4.0. I'm just not familiar with it yet. So the 4.0, I can't imagine. There's no life anymore after 4. <laughs> We're all on the computer, maybe. That's 4.0. There's no distinction. We're all on the computer. <laughs> We're all holograms or something, maybe. Or we have holograms mixed in with people. Maybe that's 4.0. <clears throat> All right, logical versus physical tiers, back to reality. Uh, physical tiers, based on the assumption that application software components found in different tiers reside on different computers. Interesting concept. Uh, we have multiple computers that run single applications now. In fact, if you think about Google as a concept and you go to www.google.com, you're not going into a computer server, you're going into a group housing of servers, and you have multiple different physical components that are making up everything you're doing. In fact, the mail, the maps, the everything, the talk, the chat, crap, excuse me, stuff, <laughs> you put uh, on different servers. It's spread out over thousands of servers all over the world. If you think, well, actually, not really. It's actually located in a couple different states, but um, long story short, it's not just one computer like in the old days when we had a one computer that was housing everything, and then we duplicates of the computer. Instead, you break the application out over the physical hardware, and a couple of different physical devices can be running the same application. You got the application, and the, what what makes that possible is the middleware. It's the RMI. It's the server technology. It's the web server, the application server, the database server, all working together and communicating transparently. So using that word transparent again. It takes away the seams between the different physical devices as well. So we have uh, different processors as well, different processor speeds. So it allows us to grow. And I, last week I talked about uh, being able to downsize or upscale or you know, the whole flexibility in terms of the configuration is important. We'll start talking about networking as well. Logical tiers, if the system is deployed on a single computer but has separate software tiers associated with it, it might be logically separated out. 
Nowadays, when you start thinking about logical tiers, they're actually on logical different physical devices as well. And the logical part would be more along the lines of defining things as a web server or as an application server or as a database server. And I use that word server loosely. It's more like component module. Because a database server is not necessarily a server. And it might actually logically reside on an application server. So it may not necessarily be its own server. So here's some physical tiers. There's three of them. We got Windows XP, we got a Unix host, and we got a Linux host in here. We got Apache, we got Oracle, and we got an internet browser. So the different physical tiers and then the logical tiers that it's relating to looks the same if you think about it uh, in terms of this particular example. But this particular tier is serving on more than one client. So logically, we're going into a web server and then we're attaching to a database. And so we might have, and here we have one to one. What we can start doing, and this is one to many, this little asterisk means many. And this is sort of a, if you're familiar with ER diagrams, this is an ER diagram. <laughs> so uh, these are entities that are connected together with lines and cardinality. So long story short, we can start playing with the numbers and we can have one internet browser that's connecting to, you know, 25 Apache servers that's connecting to 12 databases or something. And so we can grow the system size by adding on multiples logical and physical tiers to the configuration. So here's a application example. So we're going to build an application and it's a single tier architecture. Not the best for fault tolerance or for uh, con you know, connectivity either, actually. This is a student services application. And the simplicity is good. So the pro of putting it all on one tier. And what I'm going to do is break this out in the next couple of slides into multiple tiers and show you how to logically separate, which is kind of one of the things we're thinking about in this course as we get past the basic stuff. The simplicity is great of the single tier. It provides a convenient initial framework for subsequent examining more sophisticated multi-tier architectures. So we can look at this and then we can figure out, well, how do we want to make this into a multi-tier? This tier is based on common functionality, which is quite common, actually. Uh, to break it out by functionality, we don't have to break it out by functionality, but that's the way that it's usually done. In terms of the student services, we've got the logical client, we got the server, and then we got the persistent data. So these are the three areas here, the three kind of tiers that are put into this. And this again looks like an entity relationship diagram actually as well, where we've got on the client side, we've got an advisor panel, a schedule panel, let's say that's from a UI user interface that is going to give us um, a connection to a server and we're going to have a connection to a server, I should say, that's going to attach to these modules here. And then these modules are going to use these packages over here. And over here, we're on the database end. So this might be coming from a database engine or some sort of other persistent file access storage system. Down here, uh, we might have a domain server. We have an application server. We might have multiple different types of interfaces between the servers that are sharing the workload. And then the domain is shared between all of the different tiers. So this would be here, this would be, you know, this would be connecting here, this guy would be coming connecting to here. So the connectivity between the tiers is important. And keep in mind this is all happening and this is local host over here because this is basically trying to tell you it's all happening on one server, all of these different components. So the first thing we can kind of do is figure out, well, how are we going to logically break this out? Because we're going to now we're going to decide on our architecture of our distributed system that we're going to create. Because what we're trying to do is create a distributed system. That's not very safe in the long run. What happens if that server goes down? <laughs> Everything goes down. And not only that, but what happens if you have a lot of people connected to that server? Very slow. Not very, not very efficient. So we need to do tiering to make it efficient, to make it fault tolerant for various different reasons. So if we break it out into a two-tier physical architecture, we're looking at separating out the client and the server. This is the traditional model. In fact, this is what we're going to look at in the next lecture in terms of the client-server model using UDP and TCP for connectivity. And here's TCP as an example running over IP. And that's going to be the theme of the next lecture, actually, uh, to, connect, to, to connect them. 
And so the TCP versus the UDP running over IP, well, IP is an internet protocol. And the TCP and the UDP is whether you want reliable or whether you want unreliable transport protocol. And this relates to the OSI stack. So if you've taken a networking course in the past as an undergraduate, you learned about the OSI model, open systems, you know, and people hate that stuff, you know. And then you memorize the all people seem to need data processing, which is the A for application, P for presentation, and all the different layers going through. Yeah, I, I can't. If I, if I thought hard enough, I'd be able to come. I, I remember all people seem to need data processing, though. <laughs> Is the mnemonic to remember the OS layers of the OSI model. However, it does make sense because those are the model layers, and we're going to be looking at it fairly soon here, that are defining our architecture in terms of the protocols that we're using to make the connections between all of the different tiers in this architecture. So some of the tiering is done at a network, some of it's done at a data link, some of it's done you know different levels, layers in that OSI model. And it's just nothing more than defining the standard if you haven't heard of the OSI model. But here we have our, uh, in this figure, we're transforming it into a two-tiered architecture by deploying the classes that are relative to the client, putting them over here, and then a different host for the classes that are related to the server. And we're going to see a working model of this in the next lecture when we start looking at connecting clients and servers. It's actually pretty easy in Java uh, to create um, separate clients and servers and create a socket, essentially. This is a socket abstraction. So. I wouldn't be giving you a true EE class if I didn't talk about sockets. So, <laughs> Although sockets are still being used, actually. Sockets are the underlying implementation of RMI. RMI underneath the hood is implemented using sockets. So it's still relevant. You're just not ever going to create a socket on your own. You're going to do something else more sophisticated. Uh, you're going to use a higher level API that's going to automate things for you. Here's a three tier. So in the first tier, two-tier section, we broke out the client and the server. The three tiers to break out the persistent data, as I mentioned before. And you want to start calling it persistent data. It's the database, but it is, it is the persistent data, the persistent state or information. So the simplicity of the two-tier presented in the, figure, in the previous figures transformed into the three-tier by separating out the persistence in the server tier to its own tier. Uh, so we have the client, the server, and then we have the database that replaces file I.O. Or you can also consider this a file server. And this is when we're going to start here, talk about TCP IP, UDP IP, and then get into JDBC. Because we actually need all three of them, if you think about it. Uh, because this isn't going to be a TCP IP. This isn't going to be an RMI. This is not going to be connected through RMI either. You're going to be using JDBC, uh, especially in the Java environment. And this is actually quite easy, because uh, once this is set up, you have the server application. Rarely do you actually have a client who connects, but it's possible. You can have a client that connects directly to the server and bypasses, excuse me, directly to the database server and bypasses the server completely. That is possible. But normally for tiering, you're going to put the database server behind the server. And when I say behind, I always think of this is the front end and this is the back end. Because this is protect this you need to protect this stuff. You don't want clients logging into the server. Yeah, like the database server. That's what the web server is for. You put all the gateway stuff and all the protective firewall stuff on the web server. <laughs> and then if they get through the web server, which is gonna be pretty hard, then they can start cracking into the database server. Database servers by default, that tier, not very protective. What are we looking at? We're looking at the database software. You know, how many database software manufacturers out there build heavy-duty security in their, their programs? You're lucky to have password protection, and you're lucky to have <laughs> user logins, and then everyone's got the same user login, you know. Or it's, there is protection. Don't, uh, don't think that there isn't, uh, but it's not as strong as there would be in a web environment. So Here's a multi-tier physical architecture for a large telecommunication company. Uh, this application really can't be built out any further. We're looking at a, a three-tier, you know, which is fairly decent, you know, for your average con your average small-time application is going to be a three-tier kind of architecture. You look at something a little bit more complicated here. We could look at a larger. The key to this architecture concerns with the fact that any client can communicate with any web server, but these clients cannot directly communicate with the other tiers. So, as I was mentioning before take a million clients, connect them to a million web servers, 
And then as you start working to the, from the left to the right, the number of servers usually goes down in size because you don't need it. After you filter them, it's almost like a funnel. You know how it's big on the top and small on the bottom? <laughs> Only one or two items are going to come through it at a time. You're not going to get all that heavy-duty web traffic, which is great because you filter it out like just like a funnel, and you get them through the web server. And then you know they're not going to waste they're not going to waste the application server's time, and the application server doesn't have to figure out what they want. By the time they make it to the application server, they know what they want. You're only getting one thing out of that application server. So this is what would be referred to as a bottleneck or bot potential bottleneck areas. So you tear it out to reduce the bottleneck, essentially, because you can only need one or two lines here. If you had all these guys connecting in here, these guys are going to create a bottleneck, and a bottleneck is nothing more than you know traffic jam. <laughs> Everybody all trying to take the same freeway at the same time causes a problem. So if we could do this with our traffic system, that'd be fantastic. Send everybody to one of these web servers, and then selectively send them out to application servers. All right, you need to go this way, you go this way, you guys go that way. It's kind of like what the traffic cop does when there's an accident and the intersections close down, and then direct people. That's what this guy, that's what web server is actually doing. It's directing the traffic. And then out here, the application server doesn't deal with the client at all. In fact, you can draw a big old line right here if you wanted to and just say, these guys might talk to each other, and they probably do if they're sharing data. But these guys out here are legacy stuff, file servers, databases. This is your persistent layer. They're not talking to the clients at all. So just the application servers are dealing with them. So this can be highly restrictive. This can be highly configured. Not too much traffic. This is predictable. This will be a consistent level of traffic normally. This is your, this is where your bottlenecks are going to occur. This is where you're going to have problems because you know at any one time you might have one client or you might have millions of clients that are connected. This is controllable. That's not controllable. It's predictable but not controllable. And uh, when we talk about middleware, as a definition, which is on the next slide, but I want to show you this here first. Middleware is the glue that's holding all these pieces together. It's the stuff, it's the lines that are drawn between everything. You can think that as the definition of middleware for the purposes of this class. You can get other different definitions of middleware if you want from other types of abstractions, operating system middleware. You might consider the user mode as middleware. You might consider the kernel mode as middleware to the hardware. Anything that provides an abstraction to a user or to an application in terms of connectivity, I consider middleware. You can also call it glue. Anytime we can glue pieces together, you got middleware. Uh, so it's a software layer, usually software. In fact, 99.9, .9, I don't know of any hardware middleware applications out there. They're all software oriented. And it's an abstract programming interface, usually with an API, that hides via encapsulation all of the details associated with the heterogeneity in both the layers and the tiers. I like the word transparent, makes things transparent. <laughs> so that's today's word, transparent. <laughs> so middleware makes things transparent. Uh, so layers, application layer, middle layer, platform layer. Examples here, in terms of, um, from an application level, we got the Internet Explorer, we got Firefox. You could loosely, you could loosely call a web browser middleware. Because remember, you know, none of you in here remember this, but in the old days, you used to go to a Sun or a Unix box. You could type in commands, you know, connect to a server, HTTP, WGET, you know, and you got website, you got documents that you downloaded, and that was a command line interface. And then the browser came out. Nice, point and click, type in URLs, use domain names. Well, we could use domain names in the command line interface as well, but it is a middleware between the user not having to use the command prompt and being able to actually surf the internet. So, web servers are middlewares. In fact, if you see it here, those web servers in the middle, of the application servers and the clients as well. Uh, the platform specific, running on top of uh, Sun, running on top of Dell, Windows. A uh, distributed component, object model, DCOM. Uh, or I might think of this as RMI. Actually, is another component, more newer component that's Java related, it would be nothing more than a distributed component manager. So think of it more along the lines of taking distributing components among multiple different computers, and then how are you going to manage it? Well, that's really what remote managers are doing. 
or local managers are doing. They're managing the components. So, as an example from Student Services Enterprise, Java Beans as a middleware. So, while contemplating the design of a new student service application, you realize that using a middleware platform will result in more robust applications. Uh, they can develop in a shorter amount of time. Actually, a couple of important points to mention at this point. The reason why you're using the middleware is usually twofold. Number one, it's actually easier. You know, although there's a lot of buzzwords out there, there's a lot of technologies, and people are afraid of CORBA, they're afraid of RMI, they're afraid of all. it's actually easier programming. Cuts down your steps in half, you know, makes it easier, actually. There's a higher level API. It's like, it's like working in a fourth generation programming language instead of programming an assembly language. <laughs> you know, it's, it's really quite easy. The second thing is, believe it or not, it runs faster. When you do things in a lower level assembly language, going back to that example, you know, those programs don't run as fast as some of the more sophisticated, higher level programs that are optimized for the platform that have built-in support for garbage collection and all sorts of other different newer features. So the middleware actually makes the application run faster, makes it easier to write, so, and mm, supports on most platforms these days, but there are some special specific things to consider, and here's an example right down here, actually. A web survey identifies three major middleware contenders. W3's web servers, and these links actually work. Microsoft.net would be considered a middleware, and so is the JVM, Java Virtual Machine. Enterprise being application server, this is what we're going to be using in this class when we start looking at servlets, would be the enterprise being Java Beans, which gives us the enterprise environment. What does that do? It gives us a middleware, and middleware serves up little Java programs for us. And those little Java programs connect to the application server, to the database server, and they run our services for us, and they create our tiering, actually. So we create little programs that are used for connectivity, and we create persistent object invocations of them. So we have instances of those objects that are invoked, and that are around, and you just go to the instance, it's like the traffic guard. And the traffic guard says, well, where do you want to go? To the database? Okay, here you go. Or no, you're not allowed to go, or, you know. And we'll direct your traffic. So here's an example of architecture using the components and uh, the multi-tier architecture for the student services application in the previous example using a Java 2 EE platform. And this is how we would put it together. We would use a Java Enterprise Bean component along with corresponding Enterprise Bean application middle server technologies. And then we start looking at different names for the tiers. So we're still going to look at the persistence. That's always there. Persistence is always related to data. Client, we know clients. You're all clients. You all use computers. So you're the client connecting. This is where the business logic has different names. And if you think about it from a business perspective, it really is business logic. Okay. Computer scientists call this application servers, web servers, and all the technical different types of servers that might exist, but it is the business logic of the application that's running. So student uses XP as an example, would go and connect to from a business tier, a Sun server that would connect to, uses MySQL as an example in the back end. Or from the middleware perspective, we've got the J2EE that's running on top of Solaris over here. We have the client that has a Java Bean that has a, let's say, a JSP page or something that's going to invoke a Java Bean over here on the server. And we have the application server that's going to serve up the bean that's going to connect to the JDBC driver that's going to essentially access the Oracle database that might exist. And then our database application, our Oracle or MySQL would be the application that's writing on this persistent section or tier. This would just be the Apache server or whatever type of server. And in fact, for this class, I think we're going to use GlassFish or Apache. I think the install of Java EE comes with GlassFish installed, and I like it because it doesn't have very much overhead. It runs kind of nice. It's a good test environment, and it integrates quite well with Eclipse and stuff. Um, Apache has another thing to install, so you already have GlassFish, though, so we can use that for this course. Um, and if you haven't done it already, it's not a bad time to start installing, and I put an install video out there. So you can install your Java tools because probably next week, well, maybe this week, depends on how fast I talk, we won't get, actually get into writing some Java programs. 
Uh, so that's coming uh, in the near future extremely quickly. So here's a component transaction monitor as an example. And what are we looking at here? Actually, it might happen this week. I just looked at my watch. So we're going to get into that this week. So, <laughs> so we, only have, we, have, we have a lot of time left. Hey, I'm talking fast, which is good. All right, so component transaction monitor. Another component, the server-side application that combines the features, traditional transaction processing monitors. And more recent, this would be the ORBS, object request brokers. And this is what we're going to get with CORBA when we start looking at that. And it's nothing more than components that tell the server or allow the server to connect um, via transactions with other components. And the concept of the transaction is actually kind of interesting. Uh, we don't really need to deal with it in a normal client-server environment. We start looking at the multi-tier distributed environment. We have many different pieces of the puzzle that fit together to form this transaction. And if we don't keep track of it, part of it might complete, part of it might not complete. And if we don't think about it in terms of what makes the transaction possible, then we've got bad data. It leads to really bad, poor data, debate, data, data entry, poor transactions, you get half fulfilled orders, you got clients that aren't in the database that have made orders that you can't ship to because you don't have an address, and you have a whole bunch of issues that are associated with that. So we have TPM, which emerged in the 1960s, and these are just uh, another versions of CTM, which is an outdated acronym, nobody uses it anymore. It's really just a transaction monitor, is what they call these things, uh, component monitors or transaction monitors or managers, for lack of a better word. Uh, ORB, Emerged uh, Support Deployment of Objects, RMI as well, that we're going to look at in this class, it's a remote module invocation. And uh, when we start looking at the concept, especially when we we're referring to transactions and objects, we look at the object life cycle in terms of the creation of the components. So the life cycle of the object is the life of the object itself from the creation, modification, deletion, its existence. So object instance. And in fact, that's where their RMI comes into place. Not the main data associated with the application, no save data, but the instance of the object and anything that might be associated with functionality for that object's behavior. We manage it, and that becomes part of the transaction processing that we're performing uh, through the middleware. We have a factory design pattern as a concept, often used to encapsulate functionality associated with the life cycle, maintenance of an object. So we have a factory where we're building objects, we're creating objects. And um, it's nothing more than a, an example of a design pattern in terms of object oriented. It's not UML, it's, uh, it's more of an object oriented design pattern. Uh, traditional type of patterning approach, factory model. Uh, so the pattern uh, separates the business logic on the domain being modeled from the object's life cycle. Uh, so here's an example of a student factory in a distributed system to give you a little perspective on what this terminology is referring to. The student factory contains methods for creating, finding, and removing a student object. And so the student factory here we have the creates, and this again is another entity relationship slash class model, class diagram. This is actually UML notation, uh, meaning that we have a method to create. The object is created. It contains operations associated with the main application to add a course, uh, find, uh, remove, uh, find students, all sorts of different things that might be associated behavior-wise with this object that might communicate with another object. If we think of these objects, we house them in a server. We make instances of those objects, and they're in existence. It's just like writing an application on your own pro on your own client server, or excuse me, client computer. Except now we can call them remote objects. We can install them on a server, make instances of them on the server, and then request them. So when we remote request object instances that are already in existence, we've got RMI which is the basis of that platform. And uh, RMI is just giving you the middleware, me by middleware, the transparency, where it's giving you the ability to call an object that's not, such, that's not local, that's on a different server, and perhaps on a different tier on a different server as well. And so we have managers, RMI managers, that do transaction management. They also do object management, lifecycle, um, control, life cycle, maintenance, and things of that nature as well. 
So here's an example of the student factory in a distributed system using a singleton. And uh, what are we looking at? A factory that can be conveniently implemented using a singleton design. And again, another design pattern. Uh, another classic one, actually, the factory, the singleton are, are pretty classic. And in, in terms of this example, hides the actual location of the business object from the user. So two student objects are located on different servers. Might have uh, in this given singleton design, the new student object can be created using Java with a this is an example of the source code that would actually be you know student a student equals a student factory dot get singleton dot create. And here's our get singleton student factory. And so we can sort of use this these design patterns as a format for creation of objects and managing instantiations of different objects on different servers and on different uh, for different purposes, for different reasons. When we start doing that, then we're looking at, we're thinking about Java beans as a concept because we're looking at the ability to create small objects and actually beans can be pretty big. It's just not kind of a misleading. You know, when you think of bean, you think small. <laughs> small, not like a cup of coffee, but you know, big, small, I don't know. Long story short, they're remote, or they're local, or they're anything. They're just an object that follows a design pattern that's being instantiated and it's being used. And uh, the use of that object is determined by the middleware platform. So our persistent tier, just to summarize this in terms of what we're talking about, and uh, you can call it a database tier, you can call it a data, you can call it a file server if you wanted to. In the old days they called them file servers. Now they're persistent tiers. It encapsulates the logic of saving data, saving data to and loading it from persistent storage. Uh, so with a, a CTM application server, if we have a control monitor that's going on in terms of the application, the enterprise information is in the business logic tier, is representing using remote objects that are connecting to the persistent data, or to the persistent tier. So as with all object, remote objects capture state of encapsulated local data as well, and setting attributes and things. And there's a long-term persistence of the object that's requiring to save its attributes values to non-volatile storage. So it can be used for saving data between client sessions, for keeping track of session data. It can be used for anything related to the application in terms of the data that it might have. Here's some examples of the persistent tier implementation. As an example, the Java serialized objects, we'll be looking at that. Local files using XML. Actually, XML is a nice interface to the persistent tier because it's, you know, the equivalent of HTML, but instead of mocking up text, it's mocking up data. And so it allows us to send data back and forth to exchange with persistent tier. So the connectivity of the middleware, I shouldn't call them, XML is not really middleware. I'd say that would be a connectivity uh, approach to communicating between an application server and a persistent tier would be XML. So a lot of that stuff is XML based because, you know, how are you going to communicate with a persistent tier? You get a program that reads that XML and says, here's the first name, here's the last name, here's the serial number, here's all the information for the client, and then the Java bean over there knows what to do with it, takes all that information and loads it up into the database, or gets it from the database, or works with it somehow. Databases themselves end up being examples of persistent tiers. So design patterns developed to capture the saving of data to files or databases. This is where we get our data access objects, our DAO patterns. And these are pattern configurations, programs, utilities, protocols, built into different uh, third-party, I should call them third-party, most of them are not Java-based, they're not owned by Sun or Oracle, uh, but they're packages and features to give you that data persistent access communication, so it's a data object. Design patterns. So I've been talking about design patterns a little bit in terms of the examples I've given you so far, singletons and factories and data persistent design patterns, DOAs. Uh, DAOs, excuse me. Uh, what is a design pattern? By definition, patterns provide the generic, reasonable designs that solve problems at the design level. So, a lot of the application development, especially in the EE, and when you start working with enterprise related stuff, you spend less time figuring out how to code the application and more time figuring out how the design's supposed to be. <laughs> 
And the interesting thing is it's almost as challenging as figuring out how to write the source code because you've got to figure out what pattern am I going to use, what, what architecture, what tiering, what, how many objects am I going to make, do I really need all these objects, and what are, the, what are these objects going to be responsible for. So it's sort of like thinking an object orientation but adding the networking component to it. And if you do that, if you follow design patterns, you end up coming out with better results in the end. So there's, in fact, you can take an entire course on design patterns, and uh, it's theory. It's a lot of theory uh, with some implementation. It provides a proven, testable solution for a class of similar design problems. We're going to look at one actually when we look at JDBC, because uh, you know there's like a six-step approach, a pattern that you can develop, uh, and it's a design of a program that follows a you know pretty good methodology and. It works every time. Why, why deviate? Why reinvent the wheel if something works correctly? Uh, so using uh, JDBC components creates that pattern uh, in terms of the connectivity that we're looking for. And lends common terminology that you can use to make your own designs easier to document and to understand as well. Provides common language for developers to use in meetings and documentations and stuff. So design patterns are Worthwhile. Here's a DAO design pattern as an example, where we have a, a factory and a business object, and uh, it's connecting to a data access object, and it's connecting to a data object. We have a persistent manager out here. We are, we know what this is already. Hopefully today, and we know these objects here are connecting to this or uses this and these guys use this and this is nothing more than a simple example of a data access in terms of a design pattern that we would apply. Don't get overly concerned with learning every single design pattern on the market. <laughs> it depends on the tools you're using, it depends on the environment and the application domain as to which design patterns you're actually going to be using. It makes no sense, it's like going out and learning every Linux command on the market. When you're not probably not going to use all of them. You're going to use a subset. You're going to use a small little piece. DAO, you're using to lose a lot. Every program out there connects to a database. So you're, you're definitely worthwhile to learn about factories as well. But DAO is used to separate out the business logic aspect of the object from the code used to access the persistent storage. It's the creation of that Java bean that connects, or that bean is the object that's connecting to that persistent tier that's the design pattern essentially to have that intermediate manager of that tier so that you're not just sending everything to it it reduces the traffic make, handles a uh, request a lot faster and it makes it more secure and it gives you a better uh, as, mm, a better abstract view of the tiering actually so the design pattern helps you understand the tiering a little bit better as well in a distributed system, using a factory to find a remote object does not always require loading the object from persistent storage. So it could have been previously loaded or found on the network. That's how RMI actually sort of works. And actually, that's how the Java beans, that's how the JSP servers, uh, that's how a lot of the servlet technology is working. You know, you load up the server, it makes an instance of all that's already in existence. When you get there, you use that same instance over and over again instead of creating a new object. Why create a new object? That's what the common gateway interface did in the old days. And not very efficient. Here you got management on that object connectivity to it. So, in this example here, when the student object is sent a message to save itself, the student will delegate the request via the message sent to the corresponding data access object. And the data access object knows how to save everything. And the object, uh, excuse me, save the object, write it to another particular database, if, for example, MySQL, and where the database is actually located, where it's located. So if you think about um, reuse, every time you create an application that needs to save data, if you already have the design pattern established and you're using a DAO kind of configuration with an object, that you've created a bean or something that's connecting to that database server, you just connect to the bean, connect to the bean. <laughs> Establishing the connection to the database, setting up, you know, the information, that writing the source code is unnecessary. 
it's already written for you. So it facilitates, design patterns facilitate reuse and uh, building. So in, in terms of the factory design, a well-run factory has very few components that are doing a lot of work. And you're not reinventing the wheel, you're just using the available components over and over again. And if everything connects and uses the same components, you have one centralized area of trouble. So if there's a problem with the component, you fix it, and it fixes it for everybody. It's kind of like bad database design. When you have five entries of the customer in the customer table, and the address changes, you've got to change it five times. This reduces the actual maintenance, because if it's centralized, and if it's designed correctly, then you only fix it once. Everybody uses the same component, so you know you fix it for everybody. So it creates for better modularization of the program as well. So here's the uh, business object that uses the, the DAO factory, which is going to be serving up our data. And we have the database DAO factory. We have the database object itself, the XML file interface that's going to be used to uh, connect with the database object. And we have the XML DAO connection to the DAO factory, the MySQL DAO. So what we're looking at is those objects that are servicing up the different functionality. So go back to your first day of object-oriented programming in Java, and you learned about the object. And then you built applications that worked on your computer, and you separated them out into objects. You know, and, and those objects were classes. And you had the classes work together with each other? Same concept, but this is on a bigger scale. This is on a network scale. <laughs> so instead of putting all of those objects on one computer and loading them from one application that's running, you're loading it on many different computers, and you're calling them remotely, and you're using the middleware to keep all the connection going between all the objects. So that's what we're doing. So in terms of the factory, just to go over the pattern just a little bit more, um, the factory itself often used for further separate application servers, to se separate the application server from the persistent engine that might exist. Consider the situation in which the data may be saved either by a relational MySQL database or an XML file or something of that nature. The business object, such as a student, would request the data access object from the data access DAO, DAO factory. Um, and uh, these factories would just uh, essentially um, service up requests and process information for client requests or for application server requests. Since the factory knows which of the persistence is being used, it returns the data access uh, to corresponding to the appropriate persistence engine. So as an example, let's say you have multiple, let's say you're a bookseller, let's say you're Barnes & Noble, you're using a model like this actually because you're connecting to different publishers because there's not just one publisher in the world. <laughs> There's many different databases, many different sources of books. We have used books, new books, Pearson's, that's the only publisher I can think of right now. <laughs> so we can have different publishers out there. They all have their own different databases. So depending upon the author, depending upon the book, the title, we set the object to go connect. And it already knows which one to connect to, given the information that we've sent. So the object itself is intelligent enough to figure out, where is this coming from? Over here. Over there, over here. And so it doesn't have to go searching through everything. It already knows ahead of time. If you build it in, you make the application run faster. Have you ever wondered how fast it takes to find out there's only two of them in stock? I'm, I'm just actually constantly surprised how fast eBay updates. And that's done in different tiers. I mean, that whole database of all of the different things that are for sale on that site, and not held on one, ser not held on one server. But somebody buys it, you put it... And instantly, the counter updates for everybody in the world. So only one person can buy that thing, or only one person can bid at a time. Uh, and that's fast. But the objects don't actually have to go around and do any queries or do any searching or anything. They're already ready to go. You just ask them for the information and you just tell them what to do. So it's like having a lot of people standing around helping you. Well, those are all those business objects. <laughs> Those data objects, access objects. So the application is currently using, uh, let's say, MySQL. And for persistence, then the MySQL DAO object will be returned. We're going to see this actually when we start looking at the JDBC stuff because we can create an object that connects to Oracle. We can create an object that connects to MySQL. We can create an object. And all we can interface one application with all these different databases. And we, it's all the same protocol, it's all the same call, all the same method invocation. It's just a different object that's working with each one of the databases. So. 
Fortunately, it does take a computer that can hold the database software. <laughs> so I'm waiting to free up some memory on my computer <laughs> so I can install several different databases on it. Uh, that'll be a challenge. All right, so here's saving a, here's saving a student. Right, we have a student here, and we have a JDBC connection down here. And this is where JDBC fits into the into this kind of thing. It's the underlying connectivity protocol. And JDBC is nothing more than a driver. Well, it's actually a driver object. You create an instance of the driver object. And the driver object is just written by somebody else. It's actually not even written by Sun, not written by Oracle. Not really even written by the database manufacturer, Oracle. Uh, well, that's Sun. <laughs> but Oracle Sun, or let's say MySQL, uh, open source. Um, there's basic free drivers that are available. Some of them are better than others. We're probably going to use Connector J, actually. And we'll probably connect to Oracle um, or MySQL, depending upon what I can get installed. So. And that probably won't happen until next week. That's, that's not happening today. Uh, so saving a, saving a student here. Having uh, investigated the benefits of the design um, of the um, data access object, Approach to persistent, you decide to update your student persistence to utilize this as an example. So we're going to take that other uh, application example that I showed you earlier and we're going to update it to use this design pattern and then associate with a DAO factory. So while developing the design, you realize that you're not exactly sure how the student data access object should be implemented, but you remember JDBC. So it can be used to save the data object to the relational database. So you have your DAO use G JDBC. So, what is this JDBC? Kind of talked about it already, sort of explained it. We're going to get into this in terms of one of your assignments is going to be writing, in fact, I believe it's probably the first or second one, writing a JDBC application. So, it consists of interfaces whose methods can be used to connect to and access data within a relational database using SQL. So, it does if you're a Java developer, it does require that you have some basic SQL skill because what you're doing is you're creating SQL statements and you're sending the statement object, you're having it communicate with a connection object to say run, you know, go out there and run. And you can actually save the state of certain SQL queries and rerun them over and over again. You can do um, you know, a, a single connection, get what you want, disconnect, you can keep the next connection open, you can have a, you know, a persistent connection or a, you know, intermittent connection. Um, there's tons of different ways of configuring it and it has to do with the application design. But the framework you'll find is extremely easy and I'm not, I'm not joking, actually six simple steps and it'll be connected to a database. It's just creating a bunch of objects essentially, loading the driver, Creating the driver object, creating the connection object, creating the statement object, sending the statement. It's, it's actually quite easy. And a lot easier than in the old days if you ever tried to connect to a database through an application. Uh, especially using, um, actually it's about as easy in the .NET these days as well. Slightly different kind of format, but slightly, you know, just as easy. Methods uh, for using the JDBC interface are defined in the following UML diagram. And uh, here is our UML diagram. Kind of small, hard to see on the screen. But this is what I just verbally went through, actually. If we have a driver manager, well, we've got a driver that's going to interface with it. And I'll go through downloading the driver and stuff like that. And I'll demo this on a Windows system for you. You have a connection interface. The connection interface has a statement. The statement might be a prepared statement. So you prepared the statement, you send the statement, you have a result set that comes back, you have a callable statement, or a, you have a prepared statement. And uh, this will interface with uh, all of the different packages that you're going to need to essentially receive the result set, parse the result set, work with it. A lot of people say, well, what makes JDBC a nice selling point in terms of its connectivity? Well, in the old days when we connected to a database, we connected. I mean, we, every time we wanted to connect, we had to establish a new connection. We ran a query, we got a bunch of text back, and we parsed the text, and we started assigning the text to, you know, to, to variables, which is kind of the classic way of parsing information and sending it back. The JDBC connectivity actually returns back the data in a formatted packet of the result set, and the result set can be queried 
you know, you can actually do a loop on the result, get next, get next, and kind of go through it. There's built-in connectivity, excuse me, there's built-in features for not only traversing it, searching it, but also assigning it to other objects and using the data. And so you get it in a Java, there's no conversion. There's no, take this text and convert it to an integer. Take this integer and convert it to a float. And then you have Java types, you know, flow and integer and so there's no conversion of the data it's actually in the right format which is nice and then you can assign it to uh, you can assign it to variables you can put it in an array you can leave it in the result set and you can actually cache it on the server and go get it again if you want to uh, so there's a lot more usability built into it which I say it makes it a lot easier actually so what I'm going to do is uh, spend the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes or so and just give you an overview uh, we're not going to. We're going to see this in a coming lecture with examples that are going to be live. But as I mentioned earlier in this lecture, I had a few issues running out of disk space. <laughs> I tried to install my database, so I'm still working on cleaning up and making room, or getting a new computer so I can support a database on my computer. Uh, it is. I will warn you ahead of time. Uh, if you're going to the store, install more than one. If you're going to put Oracle and SQL, MySQL, or if you're going to Actually, even if you're going to put an Oracle, have like at least uh, 10 gigabytes available. This space, you know, it's time consuming. Well, not only that, but you get the data that you're loading into it. And you have the database itself, it's going to take up two or three gigabytes. And then you want to make sure you have enough room for caching and stuff. So, the computer's not going to run like a snail. So, I just ran out of this space, is what happened with me. Uh, but I will make a video as soon as I clean up my disk space on installing Oracle and <laughs> installing the MySQL server and stuff. Okay, so connecting to the database, and let's just kind of run through this uh, as a preview of what we're going to see. The first step is using the JDBC is to load the driver you're going to be using into the JVM. So although you are creating a JDBC compatible program, what you're going to be doing is writing a, on your client server, you're going to be writing a Java application. The Java application is actually going to run the driver, it's going to load the driver and actually do the connectivity. You can do it all on one computer for the sake of not under, not using the tiering. In the real world, what you're doing is creating a bean that's going to be loaded on the server. And the server, as I mentioned before, this on the application on it, part of the tiering is going to connect to the database. So the components are the same, you're just doing it at a different location. If that makes sense. So you're going to load into the JVM the driver and uh, you're going to follow the code, which only needs to be executed once, that will load the MySQL driver and make it available. <coughs> so explicitly handling the driver in this fashion allows you to avoid errors that uh, might be in parts of certain JVMs, as the little red note actually kind of tells you. So using a try and a catch in terms of error checking is kind of uh, not, not a bad idea, but what you've, what you've got in this particular case, this is a MySQL driver. And uh, what the slide is showing you is essentially, not, I'm not going to go through the source code in terms of the programming. We'll just do it live in a couple weeks from now. But for the purposes of illustration, this is to show you how easy it is. So step number one would be to load the driver. And loading the driver, what we're looking at is creating a new instance of the driver object. And the uh, driver object is given for us. So we download this jar file, and we put this jar file <coughs> in our Java packages in our directory where we've installed Java. And this com.mysql.jdbc.driver is the key right there that loads the driver, which is not too bad, actually. And then you can do some exception handling to see if the driver is there, if there's an error in the instantiation, if there's violating any sort of security policy or anything of that nature. The next step is to obtain the connection to the database. So the driver object is used as the connection. And the connection itself is done through a URL. So the database itself uses the URL to specify the information required. If you're doing this actually on your local computer, you can actually use localhost. And this is the case here. And in my examples, that'll be showing you live. And I've got some source code that I'll be giving you as well, so you can do it on your computer. Um, what we're looking at is uh, using the local host to uh, provide a username and a password to log in and uh, you're sending it you're using you're sending this information to the driver object but this is the URL and this is the login and this is the password that we're going to be using for this so the general form of the URL 
in this particular case, establishes the connection between the Java application and the MySQL database connecting on the same computer. So, if this would be a domain name, you know, www.my.itu.edu, yeah, and we're going to go into this database, rubs, and its a username is root, and the password is dbadmin, in this particular case. So, and actually here it is here, sort of illustrated it out. So the JDBC token designates that the URL uses a JDBC protocol in terms of its connectivity. The MySQL token and text passage indicates that the name adheres to the SQL sub protocol, which specifies the MySQL database name. And the MySQL database is called RUBS. This is the name of the database that we're actually connecting to, located on localhost. So it's going to be used for the job application. And uh, the login name's root, the password's going to be db admin in this particular example. So we create this URL string, and this is where it kind of comes in handy. So if we kind of set the data ahead of time, then we don't have to type this in every time we want to use the connection module uh, object. Excuse me. So we create a URL string, and then we send the string. And we send the string here in terms of uh, being able to use the connection string to with the driver to get a connection. So get a connection says that the, dom the domain or the host, also the name of the table or the name of the database, and as well as the username and the password that are being used. So to query the database is kind of easy. We create a string that has a query in it, and then we send the query to a query object. So assume that the following book exists in the previous rubs of database. So this is the rubs table, and uh, this, ex this data exists in the database. The SQL query required to obtain the name and the price of the book and the ID is uh, 81763 is select name, comma, price from book where ID is equal to 81763. And um, for the purposes of this particular course, I'm going to assume that you have an SQL background and you've taken a database course before. Kind of not really listed prerequisite, but it is a prerequisite in terms of understanding all this stuff. If you have never taken a database class before, have no idea what databases are, not impossible to learn it. <laughs> However, you might need a little help. Get one of those learn databases in 24-hour books or something, or go online. For the purposes of the assignment that you'll need to do for this course, the one that is going to entail database connectivity, you may use Oracle, you may use MySQL, you may use anything except for Microsoft Access. Although, rare situations, actually, no, I shouldn't say, you can use a Microsoft Access, but the learning is not going to be the same in terms of the learning objective. I will give you the script to create all of the tables, and I will give you the script for all the queries. So you don't actually have to write any SQL for this course. But you do have to have, have fundamental skills in being able to create the database, use the software to do it, but you can learn that. You're just not going to learn everything, and I'm not going to teach everything associated with databases. Better to take a database course. So. Long story short, here's the query. <laughs> now I don't have to explain the query. I'm assuming you know what a query is. All right. Here's the query and to the database, I'm querying the database. So the JDBC code is going to be required to be issued. This query to the database it begins with the first declaration of a, what's referred to as a prepared statement. So the prepared statement runs a query. And if you want to call it a statement object, it's really what we're looking at. A statement object is the statement. So we have the database connectivity object, the connection object. And we're going to have a statement object. We have six of these objects in all. Um, and they're all performing different purposes. And they're all housed essentially within the same program. But we use the objects over and over again. So we only make one instance of all these objects, except for maybe the statement. You know, we, might, we might have different statements that we're going to send. but Actually, we're going to only have one statement object. We're going to send many different statements to it. We can keep changing, and we run different methods to send another statement to it. So long story short, it's efficient because we only have one of each one of these objects, and we use them over and over again throughout the life of the program. Uh, so the string here is the uh, SQL statement. It's going to be this. This is from the previous slide. It's going to tell us uh, select uh, name, price, and book where the ID is equal to. And then you might notice there's a question mark there. And here I've actually put a number in here. This is where JDBC actually automates things a little bit for you. This prepared statement allows you to take a statement, prepare it ahead of time, 
substitute values in is what if you're going to look for other things? Maybe this is a bookstore and you're going to try and find other names by the same author or something, and you don't know exactly which one. What you do is it's, it's sort of similar to, but it's in concept, but it's not called a stored procedure. However, it's just like a stored procedure. But it's done as separately, and it's not really the same concept, but similar. So you, on your computer, on the client's computer, you've prepared a statement. You send it over to the database. The database keeps it, holds on to it. And then now you just send it the new stuff, uh, author Jones, author Smith. Okay, and you don't have to reinvent the wheel. It already knows about the statement. It already knows what you're running. And you just keep sending it. In fact, with this question mark, you just keep sending it more stuff. And then you don't have to send the whole, you don't have to prepare the whole statement again. You don't have to send the whole query again. Because what is the bottleneck associated with database connectivity? It's the sending and the receiving of all of the information. Every time you have to log in, you got to wait for the database to come back. You got to wait for the database to come back. If you can minimize the amount of traffic, which is what this is designed to do, it runs faster. So if you're using JDBC, you prepare a statement ahead of time, send a statement to the database. The database holds onto it. The database really isn't holding onto it. What's holding onto it is the JDBC driver. And the, DDB, the connectivity that's running that the JDBC driver has created for you is the one that's doing this for you. <laughs> so the that connectivity, that middleware kind of component, is keeping track of these statements for you. So next you can add, you know, well, send the statement one ID. In this particular case, ID is 81763. And so this prepared statement here, we've sent the statement. The same had this little question mark here. It's waiting for, now what do you want to search on? So if we send it just one, you know, the first item is ID as an example. So look for Smith, look for Jones, look for Harry, look for... It runs a lot faster. We're only sending a smaller chunk of piece of information. It doesn't have to run the query. It's already run the query. It's already got the results that's cached right there for you on the database. It's not sending it back to you. You're using it kind of like your custom query to go get more information from it. So it runs a lot faster that way. And so if you're building a huge application that's using a lot of database querying, don't query all over, over and over and over again. Prepare a statement ahead of time and just send it the different parameters. Now, you know, let's look for, you know, we, we went to Barnes and Noble and we searched on, or Amazon.com, we searched on this book title, and it has all this. What do you want to see from these results, essentially? What do you want, you know? And you start changing the parameters, and it run, it'll run the query over and over and over again without having to have all that traffic going back and forth. And then we're basically testing for a SQL exception at the end there. So mapping the results sets to objects, as I mentioned before. So the information is coming back. Same terminology used in databases, result set. Result set is a result set. That's what you're getting back. If one or more rows in the table were found, the result set next method returns true. So as I mentioned before, in the old days when we sent a query to the database, we waited for this whole big chunk of information to come back, and it was a text. It was usually a text stream, you know, with commas or something, or, you know, sometimes it, you know, had some, you know, name colon something, or, you know, it depends on the format of that. This is automated with the JDBC driver so that we can, don't have to parse it, don't have to copy it to a file, to a variable. We just use it. So the next is going to go through each one of the records that's returned from the result set. And uh, as in the book, IDs are unique. A maximum one row can be found for the previous query. So at least one row comes back. We have a result set. But we don't get a result. If we don't get one row, we don't get a result set. We, don't have, we have some queries that are going to run statements that are going to return results. We have ones that are going to do updates or deletes or inserts or something. They're not going to return a result. Then instead we get a separate code that comes back that says, successful or unsuccessful, which is kind of handy because then you know the update worked or the update didn't work. What other kind of connectivity driver do you get that actually gives you feedback that says something worked or something didn't work? <laughs> you know? It's usually a mystery when you send it, or sometimes it can be unless you're not implementing your own error checking. Uh, so here what do we have? Uh, hence, a success can be checked with a single if statement as opposed to a while loop. Do we have, did we get a row? Then it was successful. <laughs> if we didn't get a row, we don't have it. So once the database row has been obtained from the database, necessary to map the database object into an object, or the data itself into an object. 
This can easily be accomplished by creating a new instance corresponding to the row and then using mutator method to assign the appropriate values of the rows to database objects. And we can do that automatically. And this is kind of the interesting thing here. So book.setBook, get the name. What's the name? That's the name of the column, which is kind of interesting. So that little piece of information that came back in that result set has metadata as long as well as the data. So we can look at the name, we can look at the author, we can look at all that stuff. Makes it really easy to parse it, makes it less likely to make a mistake because it's self-identifiable data with that metadata included. And we can actually query the metadata as well. We can figure out what's in the metadata, find out what's in the metadata. So we can create a the generic application that actually goes out queries the database, comes back, takes the result set, whatever it happens to be, and formats it on the page for us. <laughs> so imagine uh, for document retrieval, for uh, all sorts of different types of purposes that, you know, different shapes, forms, fi file formats, all that stuff. You know, if, let's say the database was capable of storing a large binary object in it, which Oracle does. You can go to a database and retrieve an MP3 file. <laughs> you can go to the database and retrieve a picture, uh, a file. Use it as a file server, actually, between Microsoft Word documents and stuff. Makes it handy for different types of applications <coughs> that you might be using it for. And, you know, if you've ever seen those websites, you know, and they have, um, I think it's a doc something, you know, they, they show you this, like, little embedded reader. And inside the reader, there's, like, a PowerPoint or there's a Word document or a piece of a book or something. And... They want you to buy it, so they don't let you download it. Instead, they show it in this little window. And I can't remember what these things are called. They're like doc servers, document providers. And uh, they're usually a scam, all of them, because half this stuff is pirated. But <laughs> what they've done in some of these cases is they have a database where you can upload your document into it. You upload it, it actually goes as a JDBC or something similar to it. Loads it as a large binary object into a database table. And when you query, and the search engine uses it, it's integrated with the search querying. It finds the document and then loads it up into this little, takes it from the server and loads it up into this little browser window, and then you can pay for it if you want to see it, if you want to download it. It's kind of like a Google Books, actually, very similar. But I'm not quite sure how those are running. I think that's free stuff. I don't think that's pirated. But a lot of the, I, I know that I've accidentally run across some of my lectures and some of my assignments in those things. <laughs> so I know they didn't ask permission because I never remember authorizing them to take my materials and put them and sell them to other people. <laughs> so, so most of them are kind of illegal, but uh, are not running, I would call it in the most ethical fashion. However, uh, they're using something as an example, very similar to that. You don't know what you're going to get back, but you get it back and you get that result set back from that query. And depending upon what's in that query result set, you can figure out from the metadata that it's a Word file or that it's a PowerPoint file. And then you can present it in the browser in the correct format because the data is self-identifying, which is a lot easier than just going out and getting something. You know, what is this? Figuring out what it is, so you don't have any algorithms to figure out what kind of document is this? And how am I going to display it? Stuff like that. Anyway, back to the book example. We know there's a name, we know there's a price, because this came from the metadata that was in part of that result set. So there's a number of more generic ways to accomplish this mapping. However, to keep things simple, we're not going to discuss it in this course, the generic kind of, we're not going to build a doc viewer application. However, you could do it quite easily, do it in sort of a generic fashion. So, The crude operations create, update, and delete operations, which is what crude stands for. Uh, in terms of, uh, this is the other form of the query, where we're not getting a result set back, we're not preparing a statement, sending a statement. Instead, we're executing a query, or, or we can execute a query, or we can execute an update. Execute an update, we're not waiting for something to come back. So, long story short, the JDBC driver connectivity suite is keeping track of different types of queries and allowing you to use different types of method calls for different queries for different results, for different effects. Instead of it being generic, send a query, receive a query result. You know, it's, it's actually broken down into some user-friendly kind of format where the methods are custom designed for the type of query that you're running, handling uh, by construction the appropriate SQL statement that's going to be used to execute the course with bonding statement. So 
Since no results are expected from the operations, the execute query method is not used. Instead, if you wanted to use a crude uh, create, update, or delete operation, you can use an execute update. So you use this method call on the same object. It's the same object that you're using, you're just running a different method. And it returns the number of rows that were successfully updated, deleted, or um, created. So you just get one, two, three. Right? And then you can test if there's something in there, something was updated. If it comes back zero, nothing was updated. The person wasn't in the database or something. So you can actually create your entire database. You can create the table. You can do anything. You can do an SQL. You can do it through JDBC. So you can actually use this, create another application. And there are some out there that actually do this. Some generic Java tools out there. You give it the database name. It goes out to the SQL server that's on your website. And it will create the tables for you. It will plug and play drag and drop kind of interface. And it's just using a back end of running commands on the query, you know, running query commands through a connection. So here a statement to insert into the book. This this is a classic SQL statement to insert and then using the prepared statement, creating the object of the statement and then sending it the information. And then here we're actually doing a, a three three parameters. So we can prepare the statement, cache it on the server through the JDBC driver, and instead of writing a statement, insert this, insert that, insert, and writing that statement all over and over and over again, we just do this. So this is one, two, three, <laughs> five, twenty times, a lot easier. You don't have to, in fact, I wish this was capable with regular old SQL, because who likes to insert a bunch of test data? You know, it's like, you know, people just cut and paste the lines and just change the data. It seems kind of redundant, actually. But here you just prepare the statement ahead of time, send the statement, and then you just send it to parameters send it which book names you and what book prices you want to update. It prepares it for you. Ahead of time, caches it, sends it to you. Here we have a delete from the book with a question mark for a prepared statement and we're going to send it. We're going to say, well, delete what? Delete this ID. Delete that ID. So this is common. Actually kind of occurrence. You know, write the statement once, use it over and over again, essentially. An update. And I'm kind of going to fly through these examples because it makes more sense when I show it to you live. But I'm not going to do that for you today. I'll do it next week. So. Uh, or the following week. We'll eventually get to it. <laughs> so, uh, here's the update. Set the price to something where the ID is equal to something. And it's, it's kind of the same code over and over again. It's just using set price, set uh, integer, set the ID. So this is the end of this particular lecture, which is actually the beginning of the class. It's lecture number one still. Uh, but that was the second half of it. It's about 71 slides, so it was pretty long. Um, if you're interested, especially, uh, I know that I've mentioned the DAO uh, design pattern in this particular lecture. Didn't, this is not a design pattern course, however. Um, if you're interested in more core patterns, you might want to go to this link here. I believe the link still works. Let me just test it real quick. Uh, let's see what happens. The link goes, lo and behold, welcome to the core J2EE patterns. This link works, and that's just good. And the website will give you interesting information about, oh, here's a, oh this is a UML stuff. Uh, Java 2 EE tutorials, blueprints for the enterprise itself. These are kind of some interesting ones here. You can kind of go through this and look at uh, more design patterns. It's something where, again, you're not going to want to go out and learn every design pattern that exists on the market. Uh, instead, you're going to figure out what it is that... Uh, what it is you're looking at. JDBC is kind of an interesting one to look at uh, and that would be included in the DAO type of category of patterns uh, that might be available. And that, that website should have something um, useful for you if you're interested in that. Also, history of object components in the webs. This is middleware here. Uh, let me see if this uh, link still works. I just clicked on it. Uh, just testing the links to make sure that works as well. Transactions, components, middleware. Oh good, it still works. So this will give you a little bit of information on the t uh, middleware and uh, the middleware components in terms of a definition if you're lacking the foundational knowledge. Uh, it <coughs> explains the concept of objects, components, and middlewares, essentially, uh, which is not bad reading as well. Um, I don't have a book for this course, um, so that's why I'm providing you links of information for to look at. So next week, we will continue onward and uh, with a new lecture, and the new lecture will probably mm, might be on JDBC or if I can get my databases installed correctly, 
or it might be on a UDP and TCP over IP and more networking stuff. So it doesn't really matter what order I cover the stuff in. We're going to hit them both. Uh, but next week will be sort of a surprise, I guess, for you <laughs> to see what you're going to get. So questions, comments, or concerns? You guys all signed the roster? I know the TA just left. Oh, she left it with you. Good. Make sure to sign the roster, and I will see you next week. We do start promptly at 11, by the way. For those of you in the back who came in late. Because uh, I only go for like an hour and a half or so each of these sessions. So if you show up early, you actually get the whole class. So. <laughs> All right, I'll see you next time.